Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this video net webcast, where today we're talking about the unified head end, which we think is the natural next step in terms of TV operations transformation. Now, this is where previously separate TV workflows, and I guess the most obvious examples today might be broadcast and multi-screen, uh, can be combined in terms of video processing platforms and some of the associated infrastructure. Now, luckily, I don't have to tell you any more about it because today we've got two experts and they'll be able to give you a much better explanation of what a unified head end is. And over the next 40 minutes, they'll also be discussing some of the benefits of the unified head end, uh, looking at some of the technology developments that underpin it and the technology challenges involved if you want to migrate. And um, we'll also be discussing some of the potential impact on your organization if you go down that road. Um, now, if you want to ask questions, you can. Uh, there is a, a Q&A uh, button on your console down the bottom, which you can probably see. Unfortunately, we won't have time to actually answer the questions live on air today, but they will be dealt with after the event. So do please use that, and somebody will get back to you post-webcast. Uh, as you can probably see, there are also a couple of documents that you can download. There's a white paper about the unified um, head end, and there's also a BT case study, and the relevance of that will become clear, I'm sure. Uh, so I'd just like to introduce our speakers. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dan Gerrid, who's the Solutions Marketing Manager for Compression at AWS Elemental. And we also have Jamie Dumo, who is the Senior Product Manager at AWS Elemental. So welcome to both of you. Thank you, John. Good morning. Good morning. Good evening. Okay, well, <laughs> yes. So it's afternoon here and morning for you. And um, Dan, first of all, just tell us in fairly simple terms what a unified head end is. I mean, how would you define it? Well, you, you kind of introduced it a little bit, John, but it's basically it's the from the – and we kind of approach it from the, the pay TV operator or DTH service provider, somebody who's currently broadcasting in some way, shape, or form to the home. And it's really just uh, the combination or integration of video processing workflows. So it's taking – the primary screen broadcast and then combining it with the multi-screen or over the top or really in this case more of a TV everywhere service kind of name applies because it's the same live linear channels just going to uh, devices that the consumers have or the users of the service have um, and not just the primary screen. So if you take a look at the slide, um, the picture that's up there, this kind of gives you a quick overview of what, you know, in our view, uh, the unified head end looks like. So we have sources coming in, and these are different, uh, you know, broadcast satellite or fiber feeds or IP content for channels. And then the video processing is sort of that second column of boxes. And what that is is just basically encoders that are being managed that are taking those signals and processing them for delivery to a variety of different destinations. So the top workflow is kind of the, the over-the-top or TV everywhere workflow. So this is content that comes out, gets packaged, and goes to a CDN, and then from there to the multi-screen devices. Um, and then the lower workflows are the same uh, signals being encoded and being sent to through some fashion over DTH. So that's you know a managed network or satellite or terrestrial broadcast or cable to set-top boxes in the home. And really, when you kind of think about unified head-end, you can also kind of think about it from sort of a multifaceted approach, and that is that it's the unification of the platform, so hardware and software that runs the video processing. It's the unification or the combining of the services themselves, so the linear channels that you have or you know, the broadcast and the TV everywhere simulcast are now combined. And it's the operational unification, so it's the people and the groups that work on these, you know, typically disparate kind of workflows coming together to be combined into one uh, team. Okay, well, you mentioned um, some of the organizational stuff there, but we'll get onto that later. Just in terms of the, the technology, what developments are there in the market that are sort of helping to underpin this, the unified head end? Well, there's kind of several things going on. Um, some of this is actually just because of advances in kind of computer processing and platforms. So we have, I guess what I would call more commercial off-the-shelf software systems coming into play that are just as good as what used to be typically purpose-built, single-purpose hardware systems that are available. And they are able to handle sort of not just 
over the top or TV everywhere kind of workflows, but they can also now be used for primary screen encoding. So that that technology advance um, has really helped kind of create a platform that will work in both cases. There's also, you know, the evolution of video codecs themselves um, as new codecs arise and the gap gets closed between codecs that are used for multi-screen and primary screen. This kind of helps push um, a broadcaster or an operator in the direction of, well, maybe I should just be combining my workflows because the, the, the video compression that I need to use is actually getting more and more similar. There are also technologies like SDI evolving to be carried over IP. So if we have baseband over IP, we have to have new infrastructure to handle that. And handling those kind of workflows where we're doing SDI over IP kind of pushes the existing broadcast or, or head-end model for an operator into the, you know, sort of more the internet world or IP-based world already. So it's kind of a nice, I guess, just jump start into the, the, the internet technology, you know, moving away from the, the broadcast world that you might be in. Okay, and you mentioned about codecs there. I mean, is, is H.264 the point where you would sort of begin to try and think, well, we can converge this? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. So MPEG-2 is definitely a legacy codec. It's been around for a long time. Um, there are still operators that use them, and it's, it's used in mostly traditional uh, or, or existing broadcast systems with legacy set-top boxes that are around. But with H.264 and especially HEVC, um, which is almost required for new services like 4K, that's definitely a time where you can you can easily make the leap and do the and, and work towards a unified head-end solution. Okay, and you mentioned um, off-the-shelf uh, hardware there. Now we hear a lot about software-defined video. So, is that the kind of the beginning of this? Is it software-defined video that naturally supports a unified head-end? Yep, that's a, that's exactly right. So as these off-the-shelf hardware systems have evolved and become much more powerful in the processing that they can, the capabilities that they have, you know, and this a lot of this is just due to Moore's laws. So as these, uh, the speed of these systems and the performance increases, you know, really, really rapidly, it naturally lends itself to having a software-based solution because a software-based solution is hardware agnostic. It's it's flexible. It's agile, and we don't have to have single purpose, single function hardware anymore that just, you know, fills a single purpose. We can take the software approach where we can implement features and, and, and updates much more rapidly than we ever could before. So broadcasters and programmers and operators can now keep pace um, without having to just make capital investments in video processing anymore. We know that um, shifts in consumer demands are rapidly changing all the time, and portable devices hitting the market, um, you know, constantly. There's new devices that are, that are coming out. So, in order to just keep pace, you know, from the multi-screen or OTT side, you almost have to be in a software-based world. There's there's no way to keep up with the the changing uh, marketplace if you're just going to have to rely on single-purpose hardware that to, needs to be replaced every so often. Okay, and do you think that um, the unified head end, we should look at it as a key part of media transformation strategies? I mean, we know that you know broadcasters, play TV operators, they're all focused on sort of how they become more agile, how they become more sort of consumer facing in the sense that they get services to market faster and they can make changes quicker. I mean, so we know that there is this big transformation going on. Is this a key part of it or is it just a nice to have? No, I think it is a key part of it. I mean, the, the more and more we know that consumers expect to be able to watch content where they want and when they want. And that kind of changes the overall, you know, television distribution model because they, the consumers don't just want to sit down at a certain time and, and, and sit there for a, the linear broadcast that happens on the schedule of the broadcaster. They want to control the content. They want to watch it when they want to watch it. So the consumer expectations have jumped dramatically uh, 
not just on the devices they want it, but on the schedule that they they want to be kind of at the at their own time. So absolutely, there's a big media transformation happening, and it's a lot of it is the unified head end. You know, a lot of it, a lot of the the benefits kind of go towards helping the or enabling the consumers to watch content when they want. Okay, and Jamie, I mean, where are we right now in terms of migrating to software-defined video? I mean, we we hear um, we hear a lot about it. We know some companies are obviously doing it and they're out there early. But where is the industry as a whole? And I'm particularly thinking about when we're talking about on-premise deployments and sort of what people are doing on their own premises. Yeah. So the um, the migration to software centric solutions running on off the shelf IT servers. Um, has been underway in some form or fashion for probably at least eight years now from an infrastructure point of view. Of course, um, it does depend on where in the entire signal path you know, one is referring to. Uh, some areas of the signal path has been changing faster than other points in the chain. But holistically, with on-prem deployments, this concept is not a new concept. We can use an example of Town the Box for automated playout. So that really started taking the market around 2008, 2009. And that solution incorporates software video decoders, software mixers, uh, software caption inserters that all ran on off the shelf commodity hardware. Now, the signal output out of the channel in the box server uh, was baseband, but the workflow internally was still software defined. Of course, with OTT multi screen delivery, this workflow lends itself to be a more software defined ecosystem, but because it's inherently IP throughout. Transcoding may or, not, may or may not be software based per se, but the rest of the path is packaging, storage add insertion, delivery, end user playout, that's all IP. So the migration has been underway for a while, um, but it's definitely not complete and it may never be. Okay, and you mentioned transcoding is one of the things that may not be uh, fully software yet. And I always got the impression that transcoding was one of the first things everyone looked at in terms of software defined. Well, that is true. I, mean, I guess you know part of it is just the evolution to modern codecs. So there, there are you know more and more situations where a provider can transcode content, for instance, a high bit rate, you know, 1080p version of a stream at H.264, and that stream can be packaged and sent um, OTT for the TV everywhere multi-screen devices, and it can also be used as a stream that goes to a set-top box in the home. So it kind of can cover, in that case, both the primary screen and multi-screen devices. But in a lot of cases, because of things like stat mux that have to happen to combine channels um, into a uh, carrier signal so that it can be delivered over satellite, that kind of path is different than the one that still goes to OTT. So the, the, the transcoding Unification can happen in that the same software or hardware can power that, um, you know, encoding, but that may not necessarily mean that the same um, exact stream is going to more than one place. Okay, and Dan, sticking with you, um, in terms of head-end processes, is there anything left that we need to still have some dedicated hardware for? I mean, the idea of... Um, you know, sort of uh, going to software-defined video. It's really about um, no longer having software that's tied to a piece of hardware that is, you know, they're married together and the hardware is very specifically optimized to run that software and instead you can move to generic. I mean, is there anything where that model can't work? And I'm thinking in particular, you know, it used to be certainly considered that live TV for the big screen still needed too much processing power for uh, for that kind of model. I mean, where are we now in terms of that? Well, in, where we are today is that performance is really not an issue at all anymore. I mean, companies have launched 4K P60, five channels, all on software, running on just off-the-shelf off hardware, and that's been around actually for some time now. So from the video processing standpoint, the, standpoint, the abs answer is absolutely no. The software-defined video can do absolutely everything that special-built optimized hardware 
did in the past. We don't have to rely on an ASIC-based solution, you know, a, a software on a, on a chip kind of solution. We can be fully software-defined. The one place, or the, the, the places where special hardware is still used, um, some of the, there, there are kind of a couple different cases. One is just for baseband, you know, SDI infrastructure, so carrying video signals around the head end. That's often still special hardware. And the other is that on the primary screen side, you still need special hardware for the delivery and modulation, so for QAM <coughs> modulation systems that cable TV providers use, or <coughs> modulators for DVBS or S2, for instance, that a satellite broadcaster might use. Those are still special hardware systems typically. But everything else um, uh, on the video processing side is, uh, can absolutely be software today. Okay, so, so given that, how much of the TV head end can we unify then? I mean, in terms of what we're seeing in practice out in the field, what are we seeing unified in head ends? <clears throat> well, really, the goal is to share efficiencies in video processing, that, that side of things, as much as is practical. So we're seeing, you know, the unification on that side of things, and that covers everything from ingest and pre-processing and then some encoding or transcoding, as I mentioned, depending on what they're doing, what, which set-tops they're using, and what kind of streams they need to create. So anything that happens to the video signal once it enters the head end in terms of scaling or denoising or other pre-filtering, even things like denoising, that can all happen um, <coughs> in a single solution. Um, and really what I want to kind of just cover a little bit now is the case of one of our bigger customers, and that's BT, and kind of what they've done with their unified head end and what they, you know, it's an actual real life use case. So BT, back in 2015, got the rights to air UEFA Champions League soccer, as we call it in the U.S., or football in Europe and other places around the world. and. That was kind of the first time a broadcaster got the rights to, in the UK, the exclusive rights, exclusive rights, excuse me, to do live broadcast of soccer. And BT also has a portfolio that includes a lot of other sports leagues, including, including Bundesliga and Barclays Premier League and MotoGP. So they set themselves a goal to deliver as high a quality of viewing experience as possible to all of their subscribers, regardless of how the subscribers were accessing their content. And they were moving from a period where they were doing a game a week to doing like 350 some games across the whole season, and that would peak at some points in time, offering up to 12 games uh, at the same time. And they knew they wanted to deliver it not just to television screens, but also over the internet and to any of their apps that they have on a variety of devices that they support. So they went from, at the time, a very heterogeneous environment where they had a lot of hardware-based uh, compression systems that were used for very specific purposes, um, primarily for their set-top boxes, and then they had a second set of systems that were used for their multi-screen video delivery. And they moved rapidly, in roughly a nine-month period, to unified infrastructure so that they could manage everything across three different services. So if we look at the slide that we have of the BT example workflow, you can kind of get a picture of what that looks like. Um, just like other providers, they receive their contribution feeds over satellite, antenna, or, or fiber downlinks. And at the top, what you see is the content that goes to the multi-screen delivery. So that's the in this case, AWS Elemental Live servers handling the video processing and doing H.264 streams um, that get packaged by, in this case, our AWS Elemental Delta um, into an adaptive bitrate bouquet. Um, and at that point in time, things like DRM and everything else is handled also. And there's some storage involved, too, for live to VOD in this case. And that goes out to the, the multi-screen devices. Yeah, the, in the middle, we have just the general IPTV workflow. So that's another set of H.264 streams that's handled by BT's fiber network to the, their installed, you know, very large installed base of IPTV, IPTV set-top boxes. And then finally, at the bottom, they added a new 4K UHD service. 
And that was a brand new uh, uh, 4K, you know, service that go that went to a new set of 4K capable set top boxes, and those are HEVC encodes. And again, that's handled by their managed network, um, their fiber network, um, and it's the same live encoded systems that handle the multi-screen devices and their their existing set-top boxes are also handling that 4K HEVC stream. And at the very bottom is uh, the the management tool that's that's in this case AWS Elemental Conductor, and that serves as the overall workflow manager and provides provides sort of a unified view of all the encoding that happens across um, all these services. So this unified head-end architecture ended up supporting really high-quality live, um, on-demand, and actually time-shifted you know, uh, services to all of their subscribers. So BT was able to really rapidly ramp up and develop the system, and they have now flexibility to expand services and mix and match any offerings almost going forward um, in the marketplace. Okay, and I just want to um, dig into some of the benefits that you get if you move to software-defined video compared to the old sort of legacy approach to uh, sort of head-end processes, and then if you move from software-defined video to a unified head-end. So, Dan, in terms of uh, moving from sort of legacy boxes where the, you know, the hardware is optimized for the software and moving over to software-defined video, I mean, what are the main benefits that you gain from that step? I mean, you mentioned a couple earlier. I know you said features and updates are much more rapid. But uh, beyond that? Yeah, well, a lot of it is just the, the rapid feature, uh, you know, uh, updates that you get with software. So it really comes down to kind of two main things, flexibility and then performance. So by flexibility, we, mean, we just mean that support for new codecs, new features, things like HDR or wide color gamut, um, even things like integrated, integrating other third-party offerings, is really easy because you have a much shorter cycle and a much uh, more flexible nature that you get with software-based solutions. So, you know, aside from dealing with the set-top box issues, for instance, a provider could decide to move from MPEG-2 to H AVC or even from AVC to HEVC, so they're going to gain a lot of efficiencies by moving to a more modern codec, you know, saving on storage and bandwidth. And that's really simple and easy to do with a quick software update to an encoder. There's also faster deployments of video quality enhancements. So at AWS, AWS Elemental, we're constantly improving our audio and video quality over time. And that's really easy to do. We can, we can push updates you know, very, very rapidly. You're not going to be locked into um, a long-term commitment and a long, longer-term product cycle waiting for the next round of hardware to add new features. And then, of course, there's also the ability with software to launch new features. So you can stay at the curve or ahead of the curve with all the consumer trends in being able to offer things like 4K or UHD channels, um, HDR su support, VR, AR, anything new from an innovations perspective there isn't any hardware lag, so implementing these features that used to take months or maybe even years can now be done now be done in in days or weeks instead. Okay, and then if I take those benefits and sort of treat them as my starting point, and I now think about moving to a unified head end, what do I get from the unification that is above and beyond what you just listed? So the, the key benefits of a unified head-end kind of start with the, the obvious things like the reduced rack space. You know, I have less equipment, less cabling. Um, I, will, I will, you know, because of that, I'll lower my energy and power requirements. So things like that that add up to kind of cost savings um, by removing redundant sets of equipment. Um, and when you do that, also you give yourself more room to expand in your head-end because you've reduced you know, what used to take up several racks, maybe down to a, a, a smaller number of racks, and then you've given yourself room for it to expand in the future. You also gain things like full system redundancy at a reduced cost. So you, by combining all your processing into a single solution, you can reduce the number of spares that you, you required. Um, you know, 
previously to prior to unifying the solutions together. There's a lot of operational efficiencies gained too because you have centralized management monitoring. So things like provisioning in a, a new service or a channel, even if it's just a temporary channel, make are, are much more easier in, in the unified model. And then there are also network and bandwidth efficiencies um, that you achieve by, by having all your processing on a single platform. And that happens just because you can have a reduction in the, the routing of your video traffic, especially the source feeds coming in. And you may also be able to move to a model where you have um, less feeds coming in than you did before if you had disparate locations or separate places where different feeds had to come in or feeds have to be routed to different places. Now you don't have to do that anymore. You can have it all come into the same place. So it's all about kind of simplifying and standardizing and streamlining workflows that save you, um, you know, operationally and network-wise across the board. Okay. And Jamie, if I was a CTO, how would you convince me that I need to do this? Well, from the start, I would present um, some of the benefits. So right from the beginning, um, you will see efficiency and agility. And as a result of the efficiency and agility, uh, cost savings uh, is an inherently a uh, an end an end goal, and it is achievable. So that would be one of the first things I'd present to an executive team, because when you collapse two video paths into a one input to many output uh, video methodology, the first benefit is reduction, uh, monitoring and alarming points of the upstream uh, excuse me upstream air chain um, are reduced, and because there are less monitoring points upstream, naturally, the efforts from operators and engineering can be more efficiency, uh, efficiently utilized. So um, there is less chasing of false positive alarms and less troubleshooting when there is a true alarm because it is a just a less complicated architecture. The best part, I think, with a less complicated system for a um, – well, just overall, the best part of a less complicated system is that – it is less complicated for a large staff to understand. It is less effort to document. And uh, it is less effort to keep up with the document documentation. And all to the end, it's also less time spent on training. So engineering design and integration cycles can then be redirected to more positive uh, uh, initiatives such as R&D. Um, so in the end, there are more cycles to innovate and productize and therefore get to market with more services for their end users. Okay. And then if I was the CEO, let's suppose I'm your CEO and uh, I'm an operator or a broadcaster. I've got lots of things to worry about. This may not be my top priority right now. And you think it should get into my, my in-tray in terms of top priority. So give me the sort of the elevator pitch that you would give to a CEO. The elevator pitch would be, let's go ahead and let me set this up as a as a sidebar workflow, um, and uh, give it give it an opportunity for for a month, and let's just see where the efforts lie, because there's no harm to be done, and we can actually get an idea of what are those key metrics that actually will define what efficiency is and what agility is. Okay, and I mean, um, Dan just mentioned about, it wasn't just about even efficiencies or cost savings, but he actually mentioned about creating space for more services. I mean, is that an, a, an issue here where, you know, you actually become able to do things you couldn't do before? So I think holistically, yes. Um, so let's look at the fact from a technology standpoint, I say it's twofold. So number one, I'd say inherently you get you be able to reach to a um, um, to a position where you can actually focus, like I said, on new initiatives. So so inherently, if you're going to focus on new initiatives, by start you you are actually are expanding right there. And then from a technology standpoint, right, we're also talking about agility, which means continuous deployment, which inherently also means is that as new feature sets uh, roll out in the video space, whether it's video quality, whether it's ancillary data, where it's just other metadata in order to monetize, you can get there quickly. 
Okay. And Dan, what are the triggers that are out there now that are, you know, forcing people, not forcing them, but, you know, persuading them that this is now the moment and we should do this, whether they're operators or broadcasters or other kinds of content owners? Well, we kind of talked a little bit about it, but one of the functions could be just the desire to increase your, your overall agility. So if you want to be able to offer new services, this is a, an easy or a, a good way to start to being going down that path and being able to um, innovate. But, but a bigger trigger is often just the need to replace or upgrade um, equipment. So that's, that could just be um, the move from you know, SDI to IP sources or even SDI infrastructure to IP-based infrastructure. But it's also just the, the, you know, the, the timing of upgrading from the custom hardware or the single purpose hardware that you had to uh, deploying a new solution, which you know, would hopefully be a software-based solution that would be lower cost to maintain and much more flexible over time. Another trigger kind of that comes from the customer side is just the, the customer demands and the, the, the things that are changing in the, the transformation they're in. So customers want more channels. They want different ways to access that content as well. So if you think about the rise of things like OTT skinny bundles and, you know, the way that these services have evolved to kind of tailor themselves more to what consumers desire instead of just offering them bundles with large numbers of channels, now they can offer these much slimmer sets of channels and, you know, they're, they're seeing um, lots of broadcasters and operators kind of doing tests and rolling out versions of their own skinny bundle offerings. Then it's also just the, you know, there are triggers that you can think of that are they're coming about from the standard side of things um, that kind of make Unified head in more palatable. So. If you think of what's happening in the DVB groups or ATSC 3.0 in, in North America and Korea, they're moving towards a world where IP and um, internet delivery of streams and broadcasting are kind of co being combined. So technologies like codecs that support both primary and multi-screen devices are kind of coming together more and more. So that's, you know, just, Another way to kind of think about or consider what kind of might trigger the move to unified head-in. Okay. I mean, does um, UHD have any bearing on this? Would that ever be a, a sort of a point where you would begin to think it's a kind of a step, you know, a point where it would be convenient also to become more unified? Yes, I mean, absolutely. So it's certainly just evolving from SD to HD or from the... Um, analog to digital world, that was kind of a big move. But the move to support UHD and 4K services, um, it's definitely a, a big step up in terms of technology. It complicates your life quite a bit. And it's a good time to think about, you know, what services are going to be like going forward. Um, there's also things like VR and, you know, virtual reality and augmented reality. And wide color gamut, HDR, HDR10, and HLG formats that are emerging, all of these things kind of push the, the, the thought and help lead you towards moving to a unified head-end because these things are just going to continue to evolve, and if you want to be able to keep pace with them, a unified head-end is the perfect architecture to implement to, to, just to keep pace. Okay. And Jamie, you mentioned um, when we were talking about, you know, the, the elevator pitch to the CEO about, you know, saying, why don't we just do a sidebar workflow for a month and see how it works with the metrics and things. And in terms of, you know, giving this a try, that's, that implies that it is possible to kind of do this on a low scale. You don't have to, you don't have to dive in with a big bang approach to, to unifying. Yeah, that's right. It's, um, that, I mean, that inherit, that is one of the best benefits of software. If you, Take a pay TV operation for an example. Uh, there are workflows where a content provider signal is downlinked to the pay TV oper uh, operations, and then it's split. It goes to two different paths. You have the 
um, the path where it goes for uh, the set-top box for linear airing, so there's a conforming of the media for that distribution path. And then you have a, a different uh, potential transcoding patching pipeline for um, over-the-top delivery. If a customer, like the paid TV operations, uh, wanted to try out a one input to many output approach to distribution, um, such as unified head in approach, it is quite simple to deploy software-based applications to shadow a current day workflow. Um, and it's very, I think it's actually a very critical part of the process is to test this out. So it gives time for teams to learn, number one, the technology for sure, um, but more importantly, I think is uh, that you get to learn how to redefine or streamline the operational workflows. So what are the possible efficiencies that can be gained? Um, what upstream business systems might need a little bit of adaptation because it's very well to be the fact that different, uh, you know, modules of plugins might be needed for upstream business systems for uh, a variety of purposes. Um, you want to know, you know, what is the projected uh, total cost of ownership? Is there a projected total cost of ownership? You know, and then what are those new key metrics um, does the business wish to capture and then drive to in order to define what now success is? So limited trials are definitely a really important part of the process. Okay, and when you, when you say a shadow workflow, what does that mean for the layman? Is that something that's a non-production environment? It's not live or is that live? Yeah, that's correct. So if we uh, take a look, so for pay TV, for example, when the signal is downlinked, it can very easily be split and go to the, you know, the, the normal path um, that's on air, if you will, today, and then the shadow path. And so what you can do at that point is have that go through that secondary path and monitor it, if you, uh, it just like you would for the, you know, the primary, and then be able to do that. It's over that period of time, you can double check to ensure for the fact that you're getting the reliability that you need, that you're getting the quality that you need. And then again, uh, uh, in order to take a look from a workflow standpoint to see what other adaptations might need to take place. Okay, and what are the main technology challenges? If you start to implement a unified head end, what will you come up against as the main challenges? And I guess we're talking about multi-vendor environments here because, uh, you know, we'll assume that, you know, there are multiple different uh, vendors already there. I mean, just run us through some of those. Okay, yeah. Um, the I think the main technology challenge uh, is uh, interoperability across multiple vendors when you talk about a multi-vendor environment, right? So. Even if you collapse the air chain or signal chain uh, to have a single vendor for something like a unified head-end environment, uh, every customer environment is different. So it's, uh, it probably will never just be one vendor handling an entire video path. Um, a perfect example is ancillary data. So I've found in the past that ancillary data handling is probably the biggest variant across customers and always lends itself to a multi-vendor solution. So different vendors handling a different piece of it, um, of, of the processing. Because software companies typically leverage a continuous deployment type workflow, uh, new offerings can reach the market, market fast, right? We've, we've spoken to this uh, um, a, a bit already. Um, however, it can de, uh, reach the market f uh, extremely faster than standards committees can ratify the mechanisms to implement the new technology. So hence we get into the interoperability issue. So interoperability has to be a best effort uh, approach between different vendor companies in order to optimize the solution um, until those guiding industry specifications can be published. Okay, and um, you mentioned a moment ago about um, in terms of the sort of the shadow workflow, you could, that would help with training. But if we look beyond training at the sort of the wider implications for operations teams and the sort of the general organizational uh, issues, what could we come up against when we go to the unified head end? So one of the main drivers of adapting a software defined solution is to gain efficiency, right? Because otherwise there's no, there's no point. That efficiency is not only from a technology or infrastructure point of view, 
an organization definitely needs to look across all departments. It's, uh, it's a wider transformation, right? It's not just an infrastructure change. Um, at a uh, SEMPTI meeting last month, the uh, John Honeycutt, the CTO at uh, Discovery, spoke on a similar subject. He used to have uh, all separate teams handling different pieces of the media distribution. Um, and with his infrastructure change, he was he would be losing efficiency if he maintained that same structure. So he collapsed his teams and made one publishing team so that a 360-degree view of media distribution could be could be realized. Um, and I would say this is not only um, you know this is something that a lot of the network providers are taking a look at. So I also spoke to another large uh, content provider a few weeks back. And uh, they're also in a process of rearranging uh, how they originally grouped their system architects. Uh, so the system architects traditionally had handled the baseband part of the plant, um, and then as well as their, you know, the, their uh, architects, if you will, in the IT space, so the IT news services, like for over the top. So these two departments were traditionally separate departments. It was important for both groups to understand um, to understand how to design and support the other group's discipline. So now what they have done is that they combined the departments and started the educational process. So now both the baseband engineer and the IT engineer were system architects for all of video delivery and not just their uh, their initial work their initial concentration. So, when these system architects now begin drawing out a new solution, they are better able to focus on designing a system with a total view of media orchestration. Okay, so we we sort of get into sort of multidisciplinary teams, I guess. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And does that need to come from the CTO or does it need to come from higher up in terms of sort of cajoling everybody to get themselves organized in that way? So I don't think so. Of course, when it comes from the formidable aspect of, re, of reorganizing the group, yeah, that that usually has to come up from, from a higher up leadership team. However, there is no reason, if you will, that there's not, uh, you know, grassroots ability um, for cross training to kind of take uh, take uh, its you know take on some uh, uh, momentum, if you will. Um, curiosity between uh, you know is inherently a part of engineering. So I think you'll find that uh, even without it being formidable, that uh, different departments will uh, naturally gravitate to uh, that level of cross training in order just to learn more. But again, you do have at some point will hit a um, a ceiling of progress, if you will, because without organizational change at the top, there's only so much change that you can uh, that you can influence just by means of independent cross training. Okay. Now, in terms of redundancy, then um, now Dan mentioned it a few minutes ago in this in the context of redundancy costs could actually be reduced because you need less spares, but. It sort of strikes me that if you put all your eggs into one basket with a sort of unified head end, then redundancy becomes, you know, sort of quite scary. I mean, what, you know, what is the situation? I mean, does, do you need additional safeguards if you have everything running through sort of like a single flow? What happens? So um, I don't think that the methodology changes. So if you go back to uh, what I had referenced in the earlier part of our discussion regarding channel in the box, so that was a kind of an initial fear at that point about all the eggs in one basket because you had one IT uh, server, if you will, um, doing all of the mass control aspect of things. So I think the redundant, and that was solved for, right? And I so I think redundancy models remain the same um, because I find that redundancy models are not necessarily driven by technical requirements, but they're more driven by specific business requirements. Um, and every business is different, right? So the, everyone has a different contractual uh, service level agreements. Some businesses require a full mirror approach, regardless if it's a software-defined or hardware-defined solution. It doesn't matter. Um, others require uh, a 
N plus one type model, but it's also coupled with some level of an N plus N, so a hybrid redundant model is very common as well. Um, I think what actually changes is the definition of redundancy. So the full mirror or M plus N approach no longer has to be a macro level um, redundancy model, so you don't necessarily need a one-to-one -one, um, rack unit uh, servers running a full application software package. With the implementation of containerized architectures today, both across virtual machines and bare metal, it's possible to have different level of resiliencies or distributive loads that is based on uh, specific microservices that manage a specific task within a video pipeline. So you can have it where you have a uh, redundancy model that's on the microservice level and then have that kind of distributed out and built out, if you will, to have it, like I said, on that macro level where you might have that additional server. So that's one of the reasons why I believe it's actually a redundancy model definition that changes a bit. Okay, so it actually sounds like it gets more flexible in terms of your redundancy options. I, I do believe so. I think it actually, um, you're able to take a, more of a, um, you know, a, you get more of a higher level view on, you know, your redundancy model of you might put, you know, an additional server in, but you can have a lot of different flexibilities from the microservice level on what you might have. So that might be um, very much a, uh, N plus N, uh, or excuse me, N plus one type model from a microservice standpoint, but then with just two IT servers, and it could be looked at as a one to one. Okay, and Dan, you mentioned earlier about DVB and ATSC 3.0, and it was in the context of you know unification and how broadcast and IP are, are coming closer together anyway. I mean, is there anything in the sort of the wider world of the industry that's happening? that will make this sort of unified head-end easier in future I mean, in terms of standards? I mean, are they relevant to sort of making it easier as well as just sort of as a, as a you know, sort of general context? Yes, I mean, absolutely. So the technologies in a lot of cases, they're already there. We have continued advances in computing power just on the general hardware side. And really, standardization is what needs to come next. Um, when Jamie mentioned one of the biggest challenges with implementing a unified head end, you know, that was pretty much came down to interoperability. And those interoperability issues really start to go away once standards get ratified. And they, the standards kind of help lead the way and make everyone move in the same direction. So one example I can think of is the, the video over IP standards. There were a whole bunch of them, Tico, Aspen, any number of them from different groups. And that dust is kind of starting to settle now with SMPTE 2110. And as that standard kind of evolves over the next year or so, that will really help a lot of issues go away in terms of getting different vendors to cooperate and interoperate together. Another example is just, you know, SCUDI 104 and 35. So the, the standards that pertain to program insertion and ad insertion for affiliates to do their local commercials. That kind of, at the basic level, signaling it has to work in an OTT world and it has to work in a broadcast world. I mean, whether or not they actually insert the same ads or do this, have the same mechanisms, there has to be a way for that signaling to work across systems so that it can be handled in both primary screen and multi-screen cases. And I would actually also throw in things like, on the technology side, just the the world of consumer devices moving to support additional codecs. So for instance, Apple just announced recently they're going to support HEVC on their devices within iOS. So that kind of adoption of new codec standards really helps kind of push the industry forward and make things easier to think about implementing unified head-end solutions. Okay, and if we do this, um, if I'm a pay TV operator, a, um, a content owner, a broadcaster, and I take this move towards unified head end, what is the first move advantage? I mean, is, is there a significant um, advantage? I mean, if I do this and my main rival waits two years, you know, is that going to be a big difference for me in terms of competitiveness? 
Yeah, I think I think it will. I mean, there are already a, a lot of first movers around, and it's really you know the decision to move now is comes down to a case by case business, which depends on what requirements you have and when when the right time to make the move to Unified head in. Um, and the factors might be different whether you're a, a broad a broadcaster or a pay TV operator. But the sooner you move to Unified head end, the sooner you can take advantage of all the efficiencies and the sooner you have a flexible platform in place so that you as a first mover or some, someone that makes the move ahead of one of your competitors, you may be able to better allocate resources so you'll save costs and you'll be much more flexible so you may be able to offer services like 4K, you know, UHD or HDR ahead of your competition. So that can be a really, have a really big impact on a service provider. Um, one of the biggest things right now in the industry is trying to re retain and also grow subscriber base. And if you have the ability to offer a brand new service that your competitor in the same market can't, that could be a really big advantage for you to keep subscribers and grow your subscriber base. So, I mean, there are lots of long-term advantages and the impact of, UH, of a unified head-in only grows over time, but short-term, even, even like a two-year period, you may be able to do a lot more versus your competition in the market if, you're, um, if you have a unified head-in solution in place. Okay, well, we're nearly out of time. So, Dan, if you could just sort of wrap it up for us. I mean, just give us the sort of the key takeaways in terms of unified head end, you know, what it is, what we should do, why, should, why we should do it, that kind of thing. Sure. Well, I mean, the, the goals of the unified head end, we've kind of spelled out in great detail, but there are a lot of, you know, cost savings and operational network efficiencies that you gain when you move to unified head end. So that's all really important. And at the same time, um, you know, Unified Head End gives you a way to provide subscribers across your service, on whether they're watching on their primary screen or on any multi-screen devices, with a consistent viewing experience. So you may be able to boost the overall quality of your service. And the teams that used to be able, used to have to support equipment and manage equipment within your company can now focus on innovation. They can really think about things like testing new services um, and trying out new features with customers. So that's really a, a great um, result of moving to Unified Head End. On the software-defined video side, you know, if we combine that with Unified Head End, we get the flexibility and the agility um, that, we, that, that comes from that solution. So we know that over time, uh, just like it's happened in the past, the industry standards will change. The consumer trends will change, the customer demands will change, and the needs of, of service providers will change. So having a software-defined solution um, is really the right approach to, be handled, to handle all these changes now and into the future. So if you can move to software-based workflow today, that will make things easier and only give you more opportunities when you're ready down the road. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. So um, that is pretty much it from us. And um, I'd just like to thank our two speakers. So it was Dan Gayred and Jamie Dumo from AWS Elemental. And um, if you're listening, this this um, whole sort of 55 minutes of content is available on demand, so you can listen to it another day or get a colleague to listen to it. The questions, as we mentioned at the start, if you've sent in questions, they will be answered in due course. And um, just a reminder that there's a white paper about Unified Head End and also a BTK study that you can download from your console. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening, and thank you to our speakers, and uh, I hope you all have a, a good remainder of your day. Thanks so much. Thank you.